You have arrived at Chapter 1 of Building Quantitative Finance Applications with R. My name is Robert Brooks, and I'll be your, uh, helping you work your way through this material. Uh, uh, the uh, reading and R code should be available at www.robertebrooks.org, and I would encourage you to uh, access this material. In Chapter 1, we'll just basically be introducing uh, how the material is laid out and um, particularly focused on the different um, ways that this material will be presented. Um, the R uh, preliminaries that can be in the, in the uh, appendix of this particular chapter as well as some online materials will be available. The, uh, we will focus on uh, quantitative finance tools. The uh, uh, chapter three is focused on a whole set of tools and how to implement them in R. Um, the book is laid out primarily in three sections, instrument valuation. We'll focus here on uh, different valuation models of bonds, stocks, options, future swaps, uh, and, and um, the focus will be primarily on different uh, uh, quantitative ways of valuing these instruments. Once we've laid the foundation, which will end in chapter six, we'll turn to static risk management. Static risk management is basically taking a mathematical derivative that is, we'll take the first derivative of, say, uh, an option price with respect to the underlying instrument's value, and uh, that's actually going to be called delta. And so we'll look at a whole set of static risk measures in order to be able to conduct robust static risk management. The final part of the book is focused on dynamic risk management. Primarily, uh, we're focused on market risks, such as changes in interest rates, changes in the underlying instrument value. Uh, here, the, the enhancement of dynamic risk management is we'll be using Monte Carlo simulation. And, and be, with Monte Carlo simulation, we'll be able to uh, allow multiple variables to change at the same time. The beauty of Monte Carlo simulation, as, as you will see, is that you get outcomes that you've never seen in the past, and you're also able to explore uh, how interrelated different variables are. And we'll complete this material with a focus on selected portfolio issues. The design of this material is modular. Uh, after chapter two, uh, this chapter one and chapter two are not modular. Um, and was basically what you'd typically find in a, in, a, in a book. But then beginning in chapter three, it's modular. The reason for this modular approach is assuming you're in pursuit of trying to master, say, arithmetic Brownian motion option valuation uh, model uh, with its related static risk measures and dynamic risk measures. You can just pick, pick and choose the different modules and proceed that way. Although the modules don't stand alone, they're typically tied to uh, uh, other modules that's not hard to figure out. And, and so uh, each module is will have uh, three components. The first component is the central finance concepts. Uh, the, there's an effort here to make it non-quantitative. There'll be case studies, examples, illustrations of what we're trying to accomplish. And often there'll be uh, tabular results of the R code that's presented in a very verbal, non-quantitative approach. The goal here is, is it's more extensive than an executive summary, but that to get the sort of 30,000 foot view, what, what you typically find in say a trade book where there's no equations and they're just trying to get the main concepts across. The second part of each module is the quantitative finance material. Now, the depth of this material uh, is very technical. Uh, I, I take uh, liberties in 
and making it uh, very mathematical. And there are derivations uh, that are involved here. And um, so often uh, students that are weak on the quantitative side will struggle with the quantitative finance materials. You may have to go back to prior modules to fill in the gaps, but the path will be relatively clear. The, um, the final part of each module is in what I'm calling our commentaries. Uh, in that particular portion of the module, uh, there'll be our code presented in a, a PDF format where you can, you can actually look at it. I'll add some commentary from, uh, for different lines of code to explain what's going on. Uh, again, it's not exhaustive. Uh, but it's, it's an effort. If you're struggling with understanding what the R code is doing, you can go to the R commentaries and hopefully get some clarity. Uh, the R code itself is available, again, at the website referenced uh, pre previously. Quants, if, if you, you are interested in quantitative, becoming a quant in finance, you, you absolutely have to have a sense of humor. Somebody sent me this. It didn't have an attribution or I would glad, gladly give it. If you're a first time R user, you should ex expect to hurt yourself. Basically, you're going to write some code. You're going to think it's right. And, and uh, only later you'll discover that uh, not only is it wrong, but it's wrong in a bad way. Uh, and it takes time, just like learning a, a different uh, a language uh, you'll have a learning R uh, is uh, uh, somewhat time consuming. I, I find the bottom, uh, uh, the bottom illustration uh, uh, very appropriate. I've been coding uh, since there was punch cards in the 1980s. I've been through Fortran, C, C++, and I'm going to finish up with R. Um, you can still hurt yourself, but you can just hurt yourself in a much more sophisticated way uh, uh, and very powerful way if you know how to code in R. So whatever you do, don't lose your sense of humor if you're a financial quant. Uh, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, it's going to be uh, embarrassing from time to time, but at the same time, you're going to add enormous amount of value uh, to the firms that you serve. So by way of introduction, I want to be sure that we're clear on uh, what our destination is. If you were to endure all the different um, uh, uh, presentations that will be made with this material, uh, I have no intentions of providing state-of-the-art or programming techniques. Um, there'll be selected uh, things that I think are relatively clever. The goal is to get you functional as quick as possible the goal is to produce code that is easily readable and rec replicable. Uh, the goal is not to impress you or anyone else on uh, condensed cryptic code uh, that nobody else would understand except you. Um, my purpose is is uh, although uh, 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 my purpose is not to provide state of the art quantitative finance techniques, uh, although we will. Uh, provide some cutting edge uh, thoughts. We'll provide some innovative modules. Uh, to my knowledge, other, um, other folks are not thinking about quantitative finance in this way. I've found it very useful in the consulting work that I've done uh, for various firms. And so again, uh, you're not going to emerge as a PhD in quantitative finance out of this material, although you will have acquired an enormous number of uh, techniques and tools to be able to uh, facilitate you building your own financial repository uh, of uh, quantitative finance uh, tools. Uh, the purpose here is to provide as simple an approach as possible to learn prototype implementation code. Most firms have professional software developers, you have people that can implement your ideas in state-of-the-art uh, implementation methods. The goal here is just to get uh, test modules running that illustrate how to uh, actually accomplish uh, different quantitative tasks. 
It has been my experience uh, since at least the late 1980s that if I could deliver prototype code that illustrates how to solve a problem, uh, everyone at the firm uh, uh, has the ability to understand it. At, at the executive level, uh, I can get across the central finance concepts down on the and the with among the quants. We can cover quantitative financial uh, uh, concepts, and then with the coders, the prototype code is sort of the icing on the cake. It just makes the ability to understand things so much more efficient, so much more effective in uh, getting the job done. Before we go too much further, I think it's important to recognize that finance is a social science. This is particularly important if you're coming out of the STEM uh, fields of study. Uh, if you think finance is just mathematics, uh, you are grossly mistaken. Uh, and at the core of understanding finance is you need to think deeply about what it means to be human. And uh, that's a perplexing idea. I don't want to go too far down that road, but it turns out to be successful as a quant in finance, you need to understand both mechanism and agency. Mechanism, by illustration, if you can imagine I have a pen in my hand, if I drop it to the table, uh, the mechanism that, that had that pen go to the table is, uh, is called gravity, although we really don't understand what gravity is. Uh, some, some people think they do, but uh, it, it remains quite mysterious. We can model the mechanism of gra gravity with great agency. What, with, with great, I'm sorry, with great accuracy. What remains perplexing, however, is me as the agent decides when to let go of the pen. So if you're building a model of when the pen hits the table, you need to have a conversation with me, try to understand my nuances and behaviors. And so uh, within finance, you always have mechanism and agency. Uh, for example, in late 19, in late 2009, if you were to ask somebody what is the big risk that we're facing, people would say, um, uh, you know, a financial crisis or a credit crisis, uh, the, the you know the great financial recession of 2008, 2009. If you were to talk to somebody just uh, in in uh, 2001, 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, 2021. Uh, um, you know, what is the greatest risk we're facing? Some, they, somebody would say a pandemic. As a quant, what I want to do is be able to build good risk models uh, in light of the fact that I don't know what the next triggering event of a, of a financial stress will be. So quant infrastructure has to be flexible. Uh, the goal here is to allow you to uh, rapidly adapt to business expansion and contraction. Uh, with the, with uh, uh, oftentimes you have to manage changing quantitative solutions. For example, a little while back, West Texas Intermediate crude futures contracts went negative, and uh, the price of a barrel of crude was actually uh, neg negative. And there were many valuation models built on the log normal distribution that just simply blew up. It did not work. If, if your organization happened to have already built out the arithmetic Brownian motion uh, uh, valuation techniques, that would not have been a problem at all. And so uh, a good quant shop will have an enormous amount of flexibility to be able to change in light of changing instruments that your firm is trading, uh, changing economic environments that you're operating in, as well as uh, pricing structures. So the ability to um, uh, interchange valuation techniques or risk management frameworks is deeply important. It is a process. Financial risk management remains a continuous process uh, that uh, requires quants to uh, be ever looking for better and more efficient ways to do their analysis.